The only thing in, that's a bit challenging in this book is it doesn't name the issue, but it does address a lot of issues around it. And so some people say it was Gnosticism. There was different stuff. You can go and read up on it. Uh, but he sort of addresses the main thing. And the main thing that he says is you have drifted away from the supremacy, the authority, the fullness, the completeness of Christ. So what you've done, church, is you've allowed a lot of things on the side to come in, philosophies, doctrines, and your main thing is not your main thing anymore. And, and so he writes around that and he challenges them. And uh, even in a town like ours, there are different churches believing different stuff um, just kilometers away from us. You know, some say, hey, the gifts has ceased. And some say, no, just deep Calvinism or deep Arminianism or lots of stuff that's going around. Uh, but when you get trapped in those things, you can become like the church in Colossa. You can actually sort of almost the doctrines become more important than Christ himself. Are, are you with me this morning? <clears throat> so here he writes in Colossians chapter 2. He says, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. I, I want us to read this together. Can you read it together? Are you excited to be here? Okay, so, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. You, you almost need to take five breaths during the sentence. You know, it's just like one sentence. But he sort of <clears throat> admonishes them, challenges them. And he says, hey, I want you to walk in Christ. I want you to be established in Christ. <clears throat> I want you to be rooted in Christ. And that's where part of our theme for this year comes from. What does it mean to be rooted? You know, if you have a tree, it's rooted down. We all had a, a lot of wind the past couple of weeks. And um, if it's not properly rooted, then any wind can just blow it around or just blow it out of the system or, you know, it be uprooted easily. And so Paul is fighting about who Christ is and he's challenging the church. And I think it's so applicable to the church, especially in the West, in the culture that we come from, is um, are we rooted in our experience or are we rooted in our doctrine or are we, a lot of people want to be rooted in Rooted in a lot of secondary stuff, but not necessarily in the uniqueness and the supremacy of their relationship with Christ. And so he writes from verse chapter 1, so hang on there a little bit because I'm just, today I'm giving a bit background. In Colossians 1 verse 27, just before this scripture that we just read, he says, To them God will to be made known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. So it says, I preach Christ, and, and I want you to know that, that there are the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is Christ in us. Christ that once you give your life to Jesus, you surrender to him and he comes to live in you. And he says, don't forsake that. Don't walk away. Because now he's beginning to talk through this whole process of this church that has started to focus on the wrong stuff. And we, we see that, unfortunately, you know, you have this one part of the church that just say experience, experience, supernatural, supernatural. And you have the other side that just says word, word, word. You know, it's the word or the spirit. But we say, hey, this is the word and the spirit, okay? The word is is what we found and build ourselves upon, but the spirit is and the experience is also important because it's an outflow of what we believe. And so he fights with them and he says, hey, I'm going to get tough with you guys because I want you to focus on your main thing. Let your main thing be your main thing. Listen to this in, in chapter 2. Now I'm reading the first five verses before our main theme. It says, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, 
being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It says it's, it's hidden, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so <clears throat> the lie that we sometimes believe in the church in the West is just like, hey, God is just out there and you can just go for it. But the treasures and wisdom of God is hidden. It's like a treasure. You need to dig deep for it. Christianity is not a superficial experience. And so even coming to church, this is not where we do Bible study. This is not where we read Scripture. You must read Scripture for yourself at home. <laughs> because if you don't do it at home and you think that you can be pumped up once a week at church, then we're going to miss God. We're going to be thrown <clears throat> around by a lot of stuff and a lot of doctrines or a lot of different experiences. And this is what he's fighting for. He says, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. You know, he's actually going to read this whole couple of chapters that he, that he reads and that he writes to them. And, he's, and he's, Paul is very strong with them, although he has not even met them. But he says, hey, I've heard of these things and you need to come back into Christ. You need to walk in Christ. You need to be established in Christ. And there's a, a little word there, if we go back to that first slide of our theme, it says, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. He sort of throws it in, and this is, if you, <clears throat> this is sort of my personal opinion, I may be wrong, but if you lose the ability to be thankful and the joy of your salvation, then you've already stepped into the first part of deception. And you see a lot of people, they go on an intellectual pursuit. And then all you ask them is say, hey, talk to me about your intimacy with God. Talk to me about your thanksgiving. Talk to me about the joy of your salvation. Or some people that go into this heavy experiential thing with Christ but then they sometimes get offended because they get hurt because their prayers are not answered because, hey, we must pray for every person around the block. And you, you get these extremes and all you ask them is just say, hey, talk to me about the fruit in your life. Does it draw you closer to Jesus? Or does your, even your pursuit of doctrine confuse you? Then leave it and just go and sit at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> Just learn to worship him again, just to enjoy God, because it's so easy to lose the joy of your salvation. <laughs> and uh, I, I have a friend that always says, you know, the more you get to know God, the more you know how little you know him. <laughs> so intellectual pursuit or experience pursuit should not be your primary focus as a Christian. It's getting very quiet here this morning. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, why are you so quiet? Okay. So Paul is not condemning these lots of people, but he's, what he's saying is, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to dig deeper, get your roots in Christ, get your roots in the Word, and, and begin to live in that space of just being thankful. Because if, if somebody has set you free, and you realize like nothing in the world can pay for that, you can't get it out there. If, if, you've, if you know the complete forgiveness, if I know the complete forgiveness of Christ, Wow, you know, we have been set free. I've forgiven. I have eternal life. I, there's nothing this world can offer me that can satisfy me like him. But the world says, no, 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 there's a lot of things, you know. And sometimes we get very religious with those things. We say, hey, if I must read through the Bible in one year. But how many of you have read through the Bible? And I, at the end, I've read through the Bible a couple of times, you know. But then I'm so busy trying to read through the Bible because it's a bit of a competition. <laughs> you know, that at the end of the year, I realized like, wow, I haven't actually grown closer to Christ. What I can tick off is I've read through the Bible in one year. Yeah, you know, wow, I'm better than you. <laughs> yeah, I've read three scriptures a day and it keeps the devil away, you know. But you can read scripture, but it's, it will not draw you more intimately into Christ. And this is what Paul is fighting for. He says, Let's talk about that. Because the challenge in that whole region was the same with the church in Laodicea. And he says, I've, I, I'm pleading with you. He says, I'm fighting for you, church. You've forsaken your first love. 
it's so easy to get distracted. And we all get distracted. You know, we, uh, I was thinking this week on a, a mission trip we, we had to take the first time we tried to go into the nation of Iran. And for those of you who know a bit, it's not easy to get into Iran. Um, and so I think, George, you went with me the second time, was it the first time? But there's some guys like Alf and those guys, when we finally, it took us nine years to pray to get into Iran, to, do, to go and do mission work there and just go and pray in the nation. But around about the seventh year, we were a group of about 10 or 12 people, and we were excited because we finally, after seven years, got a visa to go to Iran. So we were excited, and we were just like, wow, the Lord opened a door supernaturally for us to go. And so we did everything. We even grew our beards and all that stuff. The second year when we got there, when we grew our beards, we realized, like, Iran, people don't grow beards. So we just, like, we tried to hide, and then we realized, like, no, this is not working. So after a day, we shaved off all our beards. But so the first time we wanted to go, we were ready. The Wednesday, before we were going to leave, we just got an email that said, your visas are canceled. Friday, no, Saturday morning, we were supposed to leave. That was another first time. And we were, like, shattered. We were just, like... We just sat in that little room and we just cried because we were praying for seven years and now it was just canceled. No reason given, just like, that's it, you're not going to come. So now the Wednesday evening, we're sitting and we, we, we've already basically packed and we're ready. We've been praying. The team got together. And so we, I just got this idea and I said, okay, Google any countries that don't acquire a visa, require a visa. And, um, and so this one guy Googled John was in Somerset West, and he says, yeah, yeah, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, those ones don't have, you don't need a visa to get in there. I said, okay, so either we can sob here, or we can just trust the Lord to go. Are you ready to go? And they said, yes. And I thought, like, why did I just ask that? That's, like, crazy. (laughs) So eventually, to make a long story short, that Saturday morning, and it was a miracle because the flights we were flying, we had to like just pay 300 rand and we could change all our flights to go to Thailand. So here we get onto the plane. We have no contacts in those countries. We're just on a plane and the Lord says, will you trust me? Will I be enough for you? Now, it's, you know, we, we all like this, that we, we sometimes have this religious jargon. You know, we say, yeah, yeah, Lord, I trust you. And the moment when you give something to the Lord and the Lord takes it, then you're like, grab it back, you know? <laughs> then you're like, we, we're all a bit of control freaks. Would you agree? Yeah? We want to say, Lord, I want to figure it out before I'm going to trust you. Um, I, 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 want, I want to see it before I trust you. But Scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. But, but most of us, because of our culture, we want to see first. We want to, I, I want to understand I want to know, I want to have enough experience or knowledge before I'm going to step into that. This was an opportunity for us to really trust God. So we get into Thailand in Bangkok and we land the, late the evening and um, we just get out and we don't know anybody. We don't know where we're going to sleep. And the stranger lady walks up to him and says, hey, uh, you look like you don't know where you're going. But I'm going to the middle of town, and I have a place for you to sleep. Would you guys just come with us? So here we get on the train, first day, whoops. We just go, I thought, like, oh, no, you know, I hope it's not like weird people because there's, like, lots of sex trafficking and lots of different stuff happening in there, the, you know. But eventually we get there, we sleep there, we connect, and now, make a long story short, we go from one nation to the other. We, it is just amazing. So eventually we end up in Cambodia. We have four hours in Cambodia. So we said, okay, Lord, we uh, just, you know, connect us with Christians in this place. So we go to this city called Siem Reap City. And now the Lord says, just trust me, trust me. Will you surrender your control? That's all it's telling us. And, um, and so we said, okay, cool. So we split up the team in two because now we're going to look for the Christians. And we want to find Christians in this place. So half of the team goes with these little tuk-tuks and they drive and they get completely miserably lost. But we're only there for four or five hours before we have to go on to the next country. Um, And so they eventually stop at a place and they just start to cry out to God. They say, and that's one of the most deepest prayers you can ever pray. Lord, help! (laughs) 
<laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's very, very deep, you know? It's actually, the Bible says it's worship when you cry out for help to God. You know? And so they just, they in, this, in front of this little, two homes in this residential area, they don't know where they are. And, uh, but our focus is to connect with the Christians, you know, and so they, Lord, help. We don't know where we're going. Take us back. And now oh, well, we need to be back at this little guest house place. And as they're praying and interceding, four guys come walking out of this little house where they were, that they were in. And the guy says, who are you? And they say, no, we Christians on our way. And they said, no, but they are the, the leaders of the whole Asia region. And they've been having a meeting on how to plant churches in this area, you know, and they came walking out of the house of the place where this little tuk-tuk got stuck, you know. So there's our first connection because that's all we realized. We need to connect with people. The rest of us sit at the guest house and we're just busy praying because we're getting panicky about the other guys that are lost, okay. And so five of us are sitting there and and we're just praying and saying, okay, Lord, they need to come. Where are they? You know, when you pray a bit of panicky prayers. And the next moment, this little short man walks in with two other ladies, and he doesn't understand English, so she begins to talk to us, and she says, do you know what, um, this is a pastor from this area, he dr- we, we drove two hours to be here, because last night he had a dream, and he dreamt that he must come and meet you at this guest house, and he dreamt he saw all of you in the dream. So are you pastors, are you Christians passing through? Um, because the Lord showed him he must come here. And so he got two hours ago, he drove there and goof, here we are. So we're sitting there and we say, okay, Lord, we surrender. <laughs> you know? So eventually it ended up that we, for the last 15 years, have sent teams to Seam Reap City, you know, to establish the church and especially the Wellington Shofar. And so there I had to learn like, hey, if you... Say you are not in control and you surrender, it is going to be challenging in our lives. We all struggle with that. We all want to grab hold on lots of other stuff, even maybe it's our own securities. But Paul says, are you, are you willing to be established in Christ where he is your sufficiency? You are complete in him. You are complete in in him, nothing in this world will complete you. In Christ, you are complete. In Christ, there is fulfillment. In Christ, there is. And so, so we've been talking about this the past couple of weeks, finding your identity in Christ. Finding, being rooted in his word. That was the second thing we spoke about last week, and I'm not going to go through there because the timekeepers have already told me my time is almost up. Okay. So there were some scriptures and to be rooted in the word, to be rooted in love. I want to read that one in Ephesians 3 verse 16. He says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through spirit in your inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the depth and the length and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, a lot of us, we have an experience with God, but it's just a knowledge experience. And Scripture says when you get into the love of God, it's going to pass your knowledge. It's going to take you into a place where you have got, got no control. Because if it's just an intellectual, religious experience with God, you know what? You're still in control. I'm still in control. But when it's His invitation, He says... To be rooted in God's love means that you're going to come into a place where you are completely abandoning to that love. But it it brings you into such a place of fulfillment that you realize, like, I don't need anything else. It passes knowledge. Isn't that amazing? It passes knowledge. We always want to try to figure stuff out. And we live in a town that wants to figure stuff out. We live in a town that is so so status-orientated. What do you drive? Where do you go? Where have you been in holiday? Where do you stay? Because the image is made around those things. While Paul says, church in Colossa, come to Christ. Let your fulfillment be in Christ. Let, because once you surrender to that place, and it's, it's almost like a point of no return. It's almost like we had to say there in Simarip City, Lord help, we are lost, we have no idea. And I can tell you so many stories. 
One day in India, we got lost. Oh, not we got lost. We lost three guys on this. We were, we were going to this big shopping area, factory area. And then I made the mistake of putting three creative guys together. You know? You know those people that are like dreamers? You know, they're all over the place. They look you in the eyes. They say, yes, yes. And you realize they have not written down anything, you know. So not one of these three guys actually wrote down the address of where they should go. They had money and all that stuff. And we lost them in Mumbai. And Mumbai is big. They say there's almost 70 million people. And traffic is hectic, you know. So now we need to find them because that evening we're flying out to Nepal. And we just like crazy. We're just praying and we're just saying, so we're sitting in this little tuk-tuk and we just decided let's just drive into the city because they've been lost for four or five hours already. The evening we have to find, I can just imagine, I, I wish I was part of that creative conversations. Yeah. Oh, the shopping was nice. Oh, where are we going? <laughs> but, you know, it, it was just the wrong combination, a prophetic guy, a visionary, a dreamer, you know, because they all looked, apparently all of them asked each other, so what, where are we going? And then they said, oh, I thought you had the address, you know, and that's not a good thing to say when you're in Mumbai, you know. But um, to make a long story short, eventually we stand and we're getting into this traffic jam and we're very frustrated. We are irritated. Now we begin to pray. Say, Lord, we need to find these people. And the next moment, a little tuk-tuk comes and drives from the side into our tuk-tuk, you know, which is this little uh, motorbike cycle stuff. And this guy who drives our thing just jumps out. And we also, like, we think, like, this is the end. And we jump out. And we, like, and when we look, we saw that here's the three creative people in the tuk-tuk that drove into our tuk-tuk. I was never so glad to be involved in a crash. I just said, thank you, Lord, for this crash. It's the most amazing crash ever. (laughs) But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so tense when you are not in control. But we control freaks because we, we like to have our little isms, you know. We like to focus on so many things and then it steals our joy. It steals our thanksgiving. It steals that first love with God. And so part of that is that we're also rooted in eternity. Philippians 3, Paul writes to the, this church, and he says, Yet, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. This is the cry of his life. He says that I might know him, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already attained. He says I've not arrived or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we are also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able to even to subdue all things to Himself. Listen to that prayer. It says, I stretch myself out because my joy is not here. I have an eternal perspective. I want to lay hold of the upward call in Christ. There's an eternity. And that is the challenge with the church in the West. We've lost focus of eternity because we want to be rooted in the things of this world, but we should be rooted in Christ. We should be rooted in eternity. This is not your home. <laughs> We are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of South Africa. And that makes you live differently. You are free. You're free from the things of this world. You can stretch yourself. You forget those things which lie behind and you stretch yourself out. There's a prize. Let's not forget that we're not living for you. We are not living for this. This is boring. 
I told you last week, you know, practice the word wow. <laughs> okay, wow. You must practice that word. Just say it again. We're going to practice it a lot this year. Wow. Wow. But if you say it from here, not from here, then it becomes so much more tense. Wow. Huh? Okay, some of you must not be fake when you get that vegetables later today and you say like, wow. Huh? <laughs> but when you get that piece of meat or that thing you like or that morpha pudding and, and flea and custard, you know, you're like, like oh, wow. Now, if you can say wow, now everybody's getting angry, you know. When you throw that, in the, or you eat that ice cream, you, all of us have that one thing we like, you know, then that ice cream and it melts in your mouth and you go like, Mm. That, that moment of that, we, we're all like eating, okay, is that, you know? But that one thing, like, you're like, like, wow, this satisfies me. Every day, Christians should do that. Wow, I'm just passing through. I'm like a hold of Christ. I'm walking in Christ. But when we lose our eternal focus, the keys of this world will weigh you down. You'll get so distracted. And then we get isolated. We get into the isms. We run around like headless chickens. Then we get offended so easily. And you should just wake, wake up every morning and just say, I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. I just do it 30 times. And you realize like you're free for the day already. Because we need to. That's part of our prayer every day. <laughs> Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The first four lines of the Our Father has got nothing to do with you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, if you swap it around and you come to God and say, Lord, give me my daily bread. Oh, I don't like peanut butter, but I like, Lord, chicken mayonnaise. Lord, give that, you know. Just in your prayer life, stop, stop, stop asking first. Worship. That's why we start church with worship. It's not to warm up so that the little short man can say something. That's it. I'm not talking about myself. Why are you laughing like that, you know? <laughs> Some of you, I'll meet you in the corner there on that jumping castle. Okay. What's how I dive on that? But so, what our Father in heaven Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then later part of that prayer is, forgive us as we forgive others. You see, because the devil wants to steal the this, this purity of your heart, the simplicity of knowing Christ. He wants to bombard you. And sometimes it's just got a religious facade on it. All the rules you have to follow. And this is what Paul is fighting for. He says, walk in Christ, be rooted in Christ. So that you can be obedient to what he tells you. So that you can have eternal perspective. Last one is to be rooted and to be planted in God's house. Psalm 92 says it. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. You shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Yeah, it's a beautiful scripture. The righteous soul shall flourish. Husbands, here's a, here's a thing, Ben. Tomorrow morning. No, no, no. Wait a couple of weeks. Otherwise, Israel is just going to say, I said it. Okay, you're just saying it because, you know, the pastor told you. But, but when, you look, when your wife comes and you says, wow, you're flourishing. Just look at how she walks differently. You know? If your wife ever asks you, if he's all asks you, does this dress make me look fat? Run, okay? Don't answer that. There's no answer to that, okay? Just say, makes you, makes you flourishing. And then you think, okay, no, that's not going to work. But so, when somebody's flourishing, it means like, wow, it's like that, that fresh flower that has opened up. When you walk through the garden, you suddenly realize, like, wow, look at, look at this rose. Just like yesterday it was closed, but now it's open up. It's flourishing. It's blooming. And that's the picture for the church. 
That's when you're planted and rooted in community, in family. Because sometimes it's going to be tough. And then you are like that little flower that is Philip. What is Philip? Philip in English. Philippin. Okay, what? Watered. Watered. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the right one. Okay, I was just checking it out. But so, when you're Philippin and you're hanging like this, then the, uh, there's some other people around you that's going to flourish, and then you're going to like, wow, you know? Because have you seen trees? A tree struggles really if it's just on its own. But planted within lots of other trees, God wants us to flourish. And the challenge is if we are rooted in Christ, we can't just say I'm rooted in Christ, but I'm not rooted in relationships. There's no one man standing. There's no one woman standing. You need people around you. I need people to encourage me, to challenge me, to rebuke me, to say, hey, focus, focus. You're getting distracted. You're just talking about all these doctrines now and you're listening too much to YouTube clips. Leave the YouTube clips. Read your Bible. Amen. Can I get an amen? You know, a sermon a day doesn't keep the devil away. A scripture a day gets the devil away. I mean, okay. Get into the word, get into that place of community. And do you know what? In community, in a relationship, you're going to be challenged to be vulnerable. And people don't like that. We don't want to be vulnerable. I, sp I spoke to this one guy last year and for six months, this guy was just like nowhere. And I said to him, did you move out of Stellenbosch or what's happening? You know, we're not seeing you around. So he says, no, 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 we're going through a tough time. And we're offended with the church. So I went to him and I said to him, the only reason why you're offended with the church is because there's pride in your heart. Because do you know what? You've never told anybody. You're not living in a space close enough to people where they can recognize you're going through a tough time. Because church is just an event for you. But when we're really in community, then we're rooted in such a place that I can draw from the courage of other people, from the faith of other people. Then church is not just an event on Sunday. We're all rooted together. We're all rooted together. <laughs> And so God would challenge us to move sometimes out of our place of isolation because do you know what? Isolation and that, it gives us a sense of security because we don't want to be transparent. We don't want to be vulnerable. Now, Estelle and them have started with the ladies with the Me Too mentoring. And, it, and it's amazing if you just see when people start to open up, not by being deep and confessing all their sins, but just starting to pray for people. So, so get two or three other people done. Some, some people are afraid to go to small group and really open up there. But just start somewhere. Say, hey, I, I want to I wanna be a bit accountable to you. Let's, let's just start praying for each other. Let's just meet once every two weeks and, and just say, hey, is there stuff I can pray for you? Because immediately you begin to open yourself. Just take one step. Because we, we, many of us have, have grown up in families where it's just like, no, 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 we don't share anything. But just take one step. Be rooted in God's house. Rooted in his family. Because in that family, like all of us, we get a surname. And like I told you two weeks ago, you know, sometimes you get some good stuff and some bad stuff. You take some Mitchams or you do some other stuff, you know. And you realize like, wow, this is, this is so us. <laughs> some of it is good, some of it is bad because you grab a culture of reading scripture and worshiping. It just becomes part of you because the people around you rubs off on you. But if you go, your family is going to be the pub because there's also going to be a family there, they're going to rub off on you. Who do you surround yourself with? And Psalm 1 says it so beautifully. Blessed is the tree who's planted by the living waters. Those who don't take their counsel from the world and unrighteousness. Because when you surround yourself, when I surround myself, you know, this holiday I read Reinhard Bonker's testimony. And I just want to go change the world because I read his testimony. I thought like, Lord, if you can do it in his life, do it in our lives. <laughs> Will you stand with me this morning?